Once upon a time, my granddad was a fisherman. They all were then in those parts. He worked the North Sea, sometimes over to Iceland. Long trips, sometimes atrocious conditions. Friends lost at sea. Hard work. A hard life. Cut to 2017 and I sit in a bubble in front of a laptop. I get up, now and then, oh the effort, for a cup of tea. This is my job. Work today for ever more of us physically is a doddle, comparatively. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, says the Bible. For some, yes, but in the developed world plenty eat well enough with no trace of sweat. This change in working life has been dramatic, and few would go back. The old jobs could be killers, literally. But has this change come at a heavy price? I'm Michael Blasland. Our question in this week's inquiry is work too easy? Part 1. Calories in and calories out. My name is Melanie Lerman and I'm a senior lecturer at Royal Holloway. Do you have a little calorie calculator in the back of your head no. all the time? No, I like food very much and I don't want to turn myself into a research project where I'm crunching numbers all the time. Melanie Lerman, our first expert witness, has been puzzling over the causes of one of the biggest anxieties about modern life. The research and policy makers often focus very much on calories as the main culprit for obesity. How much we eat. How much we eat, exactly. Around the world, people are getting fatter. In many cases, so fat that it threatens their health. The obvious culprit is calories in. And this is not taken from thin air. This makes sense if you look at the figures at first. There seems to be, I stress, seems, intuitive evidence that the story is about what we eat. For example... We're spending more on food, ergo we eat more. And second... Expenditures on some high-calorie foods has risen over time as well. Like snacks and chocolate. But... The way you're saying all this makes me think there's a surprise coming. What's the surprise? <laughs> yes, the surprise is we came across a data set that allows us not only to understand what foods people are buying, but also to have information on the calories associated with these purchases. This data allowed her to compare calories consumed over 30 years for the UK, a relatively rich country. What it says is startling. Yes, we do spend more on food, but partly because we pay someone else to cook it when we eat out. And we do snack, but snacks are still a small part of our total diet. The vast bulk of our food is still eaten at home, and there... ...is where we see the opposite. People have switched towards less calorie-dense foods, towards fish, and away from fats and sugary products... And so within food at home, we see a large decline in calories. What? Say that again. Within food at home, we see a large decline in calories. I thought that's what she said. So if we take all foods together, then what you see is about a 20% fall in calories over the course of these 30 years. That is about uh, 600 calories, so it's quite significant. It sounds huge to me. I mean, 600 calories a day, that's like skipping a meal almost, isn't it? Yes, it is. And uh, when I first presented this uh, research, a colleague said, I don't believe your data. <laughs> so I'm not surprised, I have so, to say. Yes, so we looked at another data set. From a separate source that pointed to the same conclusion. The evidence, she says, is robust. Overall, on average, the British are eating less than they used to. Internationally, in Europe and the US, for example, the data seem less clear-cut, but that too is now being challenged. What was your reaction when you came across this? Puzzled. 
we started this conversation today talking about obesity. Now I'm telling you that calories have declined quite substantially. So we were obviously puzzled and were thinking, okay, but how does this square up? Because we're eating less, but we're getting bigger. Exactly. So that's when we uh, turned to the physical activity side. So this is uh, calories out calories rather than out. calories in. So basically your weight gain is determined by calories in and calories out. And by physical activity, I don't mean sports. Obviously, that's one way to shed some calories, but people spend about 1% of their time doing sports. So no matter how strenuous you make that, uh, that's not going to explain this puzzle. Calories in are down. But the key here is that calories out are down even more. Result, fat. The obesity epidemic, as it's often called, is partly a stark measure of the change in how physically hard we work. We know that from the 1980s till today, there was a large shift from manufacturing towards uh, service industries. So the steel makers disappeared, the, the, the extraction industries, the miners, the fishing, the agriculture, that all declined. Exactly. And we're all sitting in front of computers now instead. Exactly. We see a strong rise of the office. We still consume more than we need. The point is how far the need has fallen. More of us also sit down more when we can mute. Women have increasingly swapped housework for office work. So do you think this decline in physical activity, is this an important part of the puzzle that you described earlier? Yes, I definitely think it is. Our lives have become more convenient and it's good that we have this as an option. But maybe that means there is some scope for putting the step back into our daily lives. I'm sure it must be true that as these things have happened, people have welcomed them. You know, if, you, if I said to you, look, I'm going to make your job easier. Yeah. Say, oh, thank you. Exactly. <laughs> but, and now we're looking at it it's, as part of a problem. Yes. So, our question, is work too physically easy? It has become easier. Work wasn't changed to become easier, but nobody but took it a decision has. to do it. Exactly, but it has. And uh, we certainly don't want to turn back the wheel 30 years. So we need to look forward and try to find new ways of increasing activity, either outside of work or even within work. Which invites an obvious question how? Starting with the spaces in which we work, our next expert witness. Part two. Sitting too comfortably? My name is Alexi Marmot. I'm an architect and a planner by original training, and I'm a professor of facility and environment management. And what does that mean? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, like In essence, Alexi Marmot researches and advises on how to improve the spaces in which we live and work. She served on something called the Active Buildings Project, which aimed to really try and understand the question of how people are moving or not in the workplace. The emphasis, it turned out, was on not. If we take office work, there is a supposition that people should mostly sit and probably do mostly sit. And on the other hand, there's a lot of public health guidance that suggests that we should do a lot less sitting and a lot more movement. Sitting comfortably might feel like the normal thing, the right thing. But there's a story about how we got here. Culturally, sitting, and sitting particularly in a relatively comfortable chair with a back and arms, was the prerogative just of royalty. It really derives from thrones. The rest of us made do with a bench, or the ground, or stood up. But where royalty goes, others eventually follow. Sitting is status. So it's taken several hundreds of years until we've actually 
developed a consciousness, certainly in the West, that sitting is something that we should do most of the time and we should do it in a chair that has all sorts of attributes, including backs and arms and softness and adjustability and style even. We tried to make people comfy, not least to avoid back strain. When Alexi told us some of our office chairs were so adjustable they might cost more than $1,000, we nearly fell off them. But what if one health objective, your spine, came at the cost of another, your weight? Time, maybe, for a rethink. Standing desks, for example, although beware we don't know enough yet, she says, about how many more calories they burn. What else? Stairs are a very important element, and we have ended up designing most office buildings to hide the stairs. They're usually tucked around at the back. Fire stairs. And we usually think it's a wonderful thing to have lifts very much on show right at the entrance. That's how all tall buildings work. So by encouraging stairs, by making them more visible, people do move more. So, for example, there have been some experiments which have conceived of things like staircases as places which are really vertical art galleries or vertical concert halls which should be a place where you are attracted. So, let's take the stairs. What does it look like when we get there? There's a lot of debate about whether or not if you make things like kitchens and water fountains and WCs inaccessible, will people then actually move more? The evidence on it is still scant. People are pretty clever at changing their behaviour so that if things are perceived as being inconvenient... They'll make fewer journeys. So it could backfire. But above all else, she says, is attitude. If you're going to stand up and walk around more, you need to feel, for example, that the boss won't mind. There's a lot that can be done then, which doesn't necessarily requiring actually tampering with the building so much as tampering with people's ideas about how they should be working, what they should be doing, and how they can use the building as an opportunity for movement rather than something that they feel confines them to be stable in the one place most of the time. How much difference could all this make? Frankly, we don't know. It's all so new. It's only in the last five years that more detailed work has been done on what really goes on at work within the workplace. So I would argue that we're really just at the beginning of the knowledge of what we can do. The British government advises that we take 10,000 steps a day. Let's say we can change our workspaces to encourage another 1,000. The total of that kind of effort? Maybe an extra 40 to 80 calories, which makes you realise the size of the task. That's the workspace. What about the work routine? Our next witness. Part 3. Virile Spirit. was to try and train and run an ultramarathon, so 50 kilometres in one month. But in doing that, I didn't go as far as installing a treadmill desk or a bicycle desk in my office, though, I am sad to say. <laughs> Andre Spicer, Professor of Organisational Behaviour at the Cass Business School in London. Andre likes turning theory into practice. You have to walk the talk, it's said. He runs it. He studied corporate efforts to change behaviour to make us healthier at work. The first of which is... What we might call formal wellness programmes. So this is people going into the workplace, often associated with insurance companies, particularly in places where the US, where the company provides insurance. And they're trying to say, how can we make our employees fitter and healthier? These programmes come in different shapes. Some try to stop people smoking or to eat healthier food or do more exercise. That last idea has history. 
If you go back to the late 19th century in the US, American intellectuals at the time were absolutely concerned that the American men weren't as tough and rough as they were during the Civil War. Uh, so many firms started to try and work out how can we kind of boost their kind of virile spirit. And some of that involved exercise regimes. And if you then fast forward through the 20th century, you see these kind of things happening again and again. So, for instance, in Japanese factories, you'd begin your day with group exercises. With new technology, he says, these new exercise programmes in the workplace could be taken to extremes, such as... You have to wear a Fitbit, which monitors how much you step every single day and record that. Some companies have installed treadmill desks into their offices uh, so employees can work and work out at the same time. The bicycle desk is another evolution of this, walking meetings. Um, we've even seen companies go as far as punishing their employees if they don't do these things. So there's a water company in Sweden which essentially docks its employees' pay if they don't go to the gym twice a week. How far do you think this could go? I think it will be pushed quite far indeed in some cases. So one hedge fund in London we looked at, they would uh, track the bio data of their traders, you know, their heart rate, how much food and alcohol they were consuming, how much sleep they were getting and other things. And then they would correlate that against their trading patterns. So the idea is that if you had one too many beers at lunch, does that result in you placing a trade which is going to lose the company money? But the big question, does this kind of thing work? Andre Spicer says that if you take weight as a measure of success, a recent study showed that people who followed through a wellness programme in the US, on average... Lost just under one kilogram over about a year. So it's a very, very small payoff. And there might be risks, he says, making your workforce dance to your tune, however well-intentioned, if they resent being told to exercise. What's your view? Do you think work did become too easy? Probably. I think if you look at any kind of middle-class person in a cushy job, they kind of hark back to the romantic days of craftspeople and physical work and want to forget about the fact that life expectancies have extended. So if you look at many corporate training exercises now, you kind of almost bring back the kind of physicality into the workplace to try and stimulate it. So deliberate making work more physical, I could imagine being a major trend in the next 20 years of work. If some of the hard work has gone out of work, what's striking is how hard it seems to put it back. Is this genie out of the bottle forever? Why is behaviour change so hard? Time for our final expert witness. Part four, 60 years? It's not a requirement, but, um, well, yeah, I go rowing twice a week. And I go you go rowing twice, twice a week? A week. Yeah, so okay. uh, as I'm a veteran, I let me tell you. I'm 64, so um, okay. not, not competitive any longer. but um, Any longer? That's a bit of a giveaway. So, <laughs> it's not a prerequisite for the job. Mike Kelly is another fit professor, this time from the Institute of Public Health at the University of Cambridge. He spent much of his career thinking about how to persuade people to be more physically active. The simple solution, i.e. let's tell people it's jolly good for them and they will do it, is an assumption that's absolutely ill-founded. A few people will take notice and act accordingly, but for the majority of the population, information on its own, even very scary information, doesn't bring about behaviour change in and of itself. And why is that? That, of course, is because people's lives are embedded in all sorts of other things that they do, whether it's the jobs they're doing, bringing up families, commuting to work, and from a psychological point of view, if you like, all these other things are that much more pressing. If, as a government, he says, you want to change people's behaviour, and not everyone thinks you should, there's a short answer to what you'd have to look at in addition to giving people information you would have to look at everything. Building design, transport planning, the arrangement of people's home environments, domestic environments, play space for children, getting children to school... And the list goes on. It's not just, he says, one for the health ministries. 
And it's not just for government. It is also industry. All the sectors that are involved in the creation of the things that we buy, the things that we use, including actually the fitness industry. And, of course, the individual has a role to play. We are responsible for... All that's because we're talking about replacing a whole day's steady activity. At all of which you nod and take a very deep breath at the prospect of changing an entire culture and its infrastructure. This could take a while. Now, if I can just use cigarette smoking as an example, the first paper illustrating the likely connection between cigarette smoking and lung cancer appeared in 1950. By 1962, we had absolutely unequivocal evidence of the dangers to health of smoking. And the rates of smoking, although they began to decline in the 1960s, have only come down to levels at less than 20% in the population in the most recent past. That's the population in the United Kingdom. Now, that was an easy problem in one sense, but it still took us the best part of 60 years. 60 years. Add to that the ferocious politics of public health, in which arguments rage about personal responsibility and the nanny state. Is it OK to curtail freedom in the name of a collective good? And the task appears Herculean. On his side of that argument, Mike Kelly doesn't lack conviction. In the 19th century, when the engineers were building sewers, there was enormous amount of opposition to the provision of clean water, something which now seems absolute necessity of modern life. But just before the eve of the terrible cholera outbreak, the Times ran an editorial in which they stated that it would be better to take your chance with cholera than to be bullied into health. Bullying, he says, should be out. Not least because some people, sorry, won't stand for it. Yes, yes, they might say, I know the risks, but get lost, frankly. I'll decide what's good for me. For all that he sees a long struggle ahead, this expert witness would not go back. When you look back to the sorts of hard labour that people had to do, the hard physical work, I'm absolutely certain that we've seen progress. People don't have to work themselves to an early death, actually. On the other hand, many modern work environments are such that it is just easier to sit for long, long periods rather than even just getting up and walking about. We used to work ourselves to an early death. Do we now sit ourselves to one instead? Overall, lives are much longer, never forget that. But where work for many of us was once too hard, is it now too easy? Yes, which in many ways is a good thing. But are the unintended consequences of the best ambitions? Be careful what you wish for. This edition of The Inquiry was presented by me, Michael Blastland, and produced in London by Estelle Doyle and Phoebe Keane. The editor was Hugh Levinson, and it was mixed by Graham Puddyfoot. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, you might be interested in Can We Learn to Live with Nuclear Power? <laughs>